All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. I am your host, Cardinalis, with Cody the Oracle. Hey, everybody. And today we're going to be asking a question here uh, that's based upon an accusation against one Michael Bloomberg. Politicos everywhere are complaining that he's basically gentrifying politics. If you're not familiar with the term gentrification, it's basically, you know, when uh, the hipsters move into an older neighborhood and start converting some of the... Uh, uh, the old factories into hip lofts and restaurants and so on and so forth. And it drives up the property values, which inherently drive up the property tax, which inherently drive up the expense on all the people that lived in what was once the affordable neighborhood that's now become the expensive neighborhood. And um, it's interesting, Cody, because if you don't rebuild and make the old burned out factories a bunch of cool lofts and restaurants then you're actually considered a bad municipality but if you do then the locals are angry at you and accuse you of gentrification so you're kind of damned if you do damned if you don't but either way the accusation of gentrification of politics has been lobbed against michael bloomberg because all of his massive ad buys and personnel purchases um have really, really kind of up the ante, up the expense of anybody running for politics, which was already a rich man's game. So um, it actually kind of reminds me of when James Cameron uh, decided he was going to make Avatar 2 and 3 at once. It was, it, it's considered, it's actually being called the first billion dollar movie production and he's sucking up so many Hollywood investors that people are actually kind of getting a little bit tired of him saying look Avatar is cool but you know other of us need to be able to make movies as well others need to be able to make movies too James so um, we just found a way to compare Michael Bloomberg to James Cameron Cody save this analogy <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I guess just to get into so, so what well, just to kind of get this idea here that this morning, um, because I got nothing on James Cameron. Yeah. Aside from I, res I respect how he sold Terminator. Anyway. Oh yeah, totally. Um, That's so, a story. Yeah, so anyway, this article came in Newsweek today. And I was interested. So what do Tulsi Gabbard, Cory Booker, Andrew Yang, and Tom Steyer have to do to qualify for the next debate? Uh, a lot of I'm sure a lot of you guys are asking that. Emerson poll came out yesterday that Andrew Yang at ten percent, non qualifying poll, unfortunately. Now going through this, I came across something. It kind of stuck out as a I kind of knew this. I just didn't know the updates on it. I'm sure a lot of you guys haven't heard this yet. Some of you probably have. And here goes the article. It says uh, a few candidates still have a chance. Still stand a chance, albeit a long shot, of qualifying. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has achieved the requisite number of qualifying polls, but has not yet met the threshold for unique donors. Bloomberg, however, has said he's not accepting campaign donations, meaning there is a scant chance he could ever qualify for a Democratic debate. So it's uh, a little weird, a lot of you guys. I mean, think of how long Steyer, Yang, you say Gabbard and Booker, they've been struggling, but Steyer and Yang have kind of been close to potentially getting it. And they've been unable to hit these polls, these qualifying polls. And this is kind of doubling up with a second part of this polling qualification period, which is the lack of polls being released. There isn't a lot of... I, I, I think any candidate who needed four qualifying polls, I don't even know if it's actually technically possible for them to qualify now. Or, okay. Sorry. I don't think... Let me rephrase that. I do not think to date there's been four qualifying polls released after the threshold increase. I don't think that's happened yet. Okay. Which is very interesting. So, this got us me looking into something, and this is stuff I've been hearing for a while, and this was another article that really kind of made me decide we should, I want to talk about this a bit, so, um, pull up the right, here we go. A lot of you guys I saw in the Yang Gang were talking about potentially doing something like this with Andrew Yang. Well, it seems like a couple of guys beat us to the punch on this one. Yeah. And that is Bloomberg and Trump each buy a Super Bowl ad at $10 million. Man. Michael R. Bloomberg's presidential campaign has secured 60 oh. seconds worth of advertising during the game on February on February 2nd. Jeez. President Trump's election campaign announced it on the same. So we'll go through and talk a little bit about this. As Michael R. Bloomberg's presidential campaign has secured an 80-second advert or a six-second advertising spot to air nationally during next month's Super Bowl telecast, an ad buy that will most likely cost at least ten million dollars. <laughs> the dueling ads in the year's biggest night of television are evidence the two New York billionaires are pre preparing for a schoolyard brawl on the national airwaves over the coming months, with each increasingly willing to dip into his vast resources. Mr. Bloomberg is spending his own fortune, and Mr. Trump has a nine-figure campaign war chest to broadcast her messages. The biggest dude, dude, point that is, entire week, yeah. I am going to be a Bernie Sanders fan, just saying, the billionaires run the system, look at the Super Bowl ads. Like, I will be so angry that week, you might just catch me in a Bernie Sanders shirt. Continue. Oh, yeah, well, and <laughs> it looks like the ad itself could cost millions of dollars. Now, this is just one thing itself, the fact that a Super Bowl ad, by the way, people talking about Andrew Yang running a Super Bowl ad, I would say maybe outside of Tom Steyer, Michael Bloomberg, and Donald Trump, 
a ten million dollars sixty second one time ad is probably out of reach, right? Like, like this isn't is like something that like oh maybe it'd be a struggle for like you know like Cory Booker, uh, Andrew Yang, but like it wouldn't be a struggle. Like, no, Joe Biden's not affording this. You think you think Bernie Sanders? Yeah, raised, at this point, the billionaires yeah, are flexing. Bernie Sanders raised what thirty five million in a quarter. Cool. I'll spend a third of that in one sixty second ad, in the Super Bowl. Which, by the way, I. The Super Bowl is one of those big cultural things. Like I was, like I always kind of joke with Bernie Sanders, who's waking up in 2020 and going, "Oh, Bernie Sanders, never heard of him. He's a seems like a yeah. good guy. He's been he's just he's been around for a while doing the same thing." So this is one thing, but it goes beyond this a little bit. Now, some of you guys might remember this. This is a little. This story came out a little while ago, but this is crazy to me. Now, for example, there is thousands of people who actually crowdfunded their way to Iowa to campaign for Andrew Yang right now. Yeah, they're, they're a volunteer to campaign for yeah. Yang the canvas. Well. Unfortunately for them, little did they know, all you had to do was chill out for Bloomberg, and he would pay seventy or eighty k for canvassing. Man, the former mayor who's vetoed, I love they frame this. The former mayor who vetoed a living wage bill is investing in a massive ground game, one that will stay in place even if he loses. So a little more on here. They said the uh, the operative for a former uh, Democratic presidential candidate was heading into media hibernation. She would not be jumping on board with one of their remaining contenders, but she laughed bitterly remembering how hard her ex boss had worked to scrape together campaign money and, and that, what is now though. being offered to her unemployed colleagues. Bloomberg is paying organizers seventy or eighty k. Obviously, he has more money than God, but that's Dude, unbelievable. That's six grand yeah. a month. And look, it says right here, bottom of that second paragraph, roughly double the going rate of that any other Democratic candidates are paying. Oh yeah, like I like say, three grand. Even three grand a month. Is... He just doubled rent in the gentrified neighborhood. Yeah, he did. There he, he literally just made the abuela go from have to pay two grand a month to four grand a month but, in Los Altos. What's also you know what interesting about that like, too, though, is because this is one thing. Because while you need like the volunteers in Yang Week right now. To do stuff they're doing, yeah. A campaign also does need these people that are kind of mercenaries. They're, they're just they're just political op, political operatives. They will work for any campaign. I don't care. I know the job. I've done this. You need both of them. You need the people that are passionate and believe in you, and you need the people who just collect them checks but do a good job. You need both to win an election. The only problem is those people are going for Bloomberg. Anyone who doesn't have an ideological bend to who they're going to work for, you're going to work for the billionaire paying almost six figures a year to canvas for him. So yeah, canvassers don't care who it is. I, I've met 15,000 canvassers, yeah. and you do get some really motivated, and the Yang Gang's this way, you get some really motivated and passionate door knockers that are in it to win it, and they love the guy, and you can sense it, and those are the intangibles we mentioned in many previous videos. Yeah. But there's also plenty that are just, they just know, they gotta knock 50 doors to talk to five people, so those five people can get a, uh, a you know, a, a handwritten flyer, and then three of those five people are gonna go to the polls, so if I can canvas for a month, and there's 20 of us, then we're gonna be able to win this election, so this candidate needs to go out and win enough to afford us for five months, 20 of us, that's about a million dollars. So, so I, I get that, that there's both two kinds of volunteers, but man, oh, as much as I love capitalism and I love anything that's done, like as long as it's legal and transparent and, and all that stuff, I, I do have to recognize that the optics of this are so bad. Well, I, I mean, people discredit on. Bloomberg, but now he's almost yeah. in third place. Well, I want to share one thing though, because I didn't finish yeah. that yet. There's one more thing I want to talk about. Okay. And we the, basically have two billionaires fighting yeah, for the well, presidency. This is from the same Vanity Fair article. It says, The money is certainly a nice lure, but the more intriguing part of the Bloomberg's campaign employment pitch is that the field organizing job will go through November 2020, even if he loses this spring. Yeah, it's the security. Bloomberg is pledging to deploy a field operation on behalf of whoever becomes a Democratic nominee. Just what that apparatus would look like is still to be determined. He also mentions this, though. If the Democratic nominee turns out to be Bernie Sanders, would Bloomberg put tens of millions of dollars behind a sophisticated operation to get the socialist Vermont senator elected to the White House? I think our organization will almost certainly be working for Mike as the nominee, Cannon says, but you saw that Mike put $100 million into digital ads taking on Donald Trump that didn't really mention Mike's candidacy. Which is really interesting. The, the, the quote goes on, but that's the interesting thing here is that Bloomberg, in a way, is, but he's also attacking other Democrats. He's not only attacking Trump. So yeah. he's spending money to change opinions for what and now. we know he's a turncoat he yeah. already he turned his r card and changed it for a d card yeah. well he's just a grifter he doesn't care yeah. so here's the next thing i want to show you because grifter they, turncoat you can they mention something else here which is very very interesting to me and uh here we go so this is a article from the wall street journal it said facebook ad prices surge due to barrage by democratic hopefuls 
Candidates pour money so in August, going back to August of 19. Uh, candidates pour money into ads to attract donors and meet debate thresholds, pricing others out of the market. The cost of advertising on Facebook to reach Democrat-leaning voters and donors is skyrocketing as presidential candidates try to qualify for spots in coming presidential debates. The candidates are trying to boost their numbers of donors by Wednesday at 130,000. They go on and go on and go on. Uh, the group's media buying consultant advised that campaigns typically spend between $5 to $9 in Facebook ads to generate one email address. The group, however, soon changed the strategy after one Facebook push costed about $279 per email signup. This is before Whoa. Bloomberg jumped in the race. I think he was still running some anti-Trump ads, but before he jumped in the race, this is what we were seeing for the prices. So again, as we're getting to, are people starting to get priced out of the field? And then there's one... Well, this there's... is also unique. Hold on a second, Cody. This is also unique, though, because I remember when there was a very, very tight race in Virginia. Uh, I can't remember if it was 2014 um, or if it was a special election after 2016. But it was a special election on um, in Virginia to replace somebody uh, that was in a statewide office. And I remember that when the guy went up to give his concession speech... Uh, that had lost, the candidate that had lost, I gosh, can't remember his name right off the bat, but I remember exactly what he said when he got up and he said, the people that have benefited and are most happy to hear this concession speech are the Virginians who are tired of seeing all of the political ads, right? Because it was it was a statewide election that had a lot of outside money coming in, and, and, and there was just any type of advertising that could be done. Flyers, TV ads, radio commercials was getting purchased. So I wonder if this is almost just a basic supply and demand question where usually in primaries that have five or six candidates, there's a marketplace that all of them can, can, compete, can compete in. But because there's only a limited amount of airwaves and a limited amount of radio waves and a limited amount of Facebook ads and a limited amount of pre-roll ads that you can buy and so on and so forth, then when you all of a sudden have 14 candidates, all of a sudden you have 10 candidates and you're doubling the amount of of participants in that marketplace, if that in and of itself isn't going to create a restricted supply and an increased demand, even without Michael Bloomberg's money. Uh, well, because I think the bigger problem is the imbalance in war chests. If everyone's roughly working with like four to 35 million, what are you going to really do? Because I want to show you this. This, was, this is an older article again, going back to late December. Michael Bloomberg's massive ad spending greatly affecting TV markets. Some of this data right here. The typical TV market increased their rates by 22% as the political spending poured in, and advertising analytics analysts found. Houston was among the markets that responded most actively. This is partially attributable to Bloomberg's $1 million buy, increasing the political spending in the market tenfold. This shock spending increase was matched by a 45% increase in rates, which is among the highest of any market. Now, again... The majority of candidates who are not Steyer and Bloomberg, independent billionaires who can afford this, even Bernie, who's leading in fundraising, do you think Bernie Sanders can just take a 45% hit in the cost of running TV ads like nothing? Yeah, no, that's brutal. Like it doesn't impact his campaign at all. That's remember, brutal. Remember, Michael Bloomberg is spending $10 million to run a Super Bowl ad. He's not accepting a dollar in donations and refusing to be on the debate stage because of it. Like the money disparity is... Like, you will always have the candidates raising more than the others, right? Yeah. Again, like I think a great example is look at Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. They're neck and neck in the polls, but Bernie raised, I think, $14 million more than Joe Biden did. A lot of money. That's also 60 seconds for Michael Bloomberg. That It takes it might, this Michael Bloomberg 60 seconds of airtime to burn through what takes most candidates uh, two dollars. months to raise. I mean, and, yeah, that's his Q3, man. Yeah, and That's the, Andrew Yang's entire Q3. Yeah, on one ad. And the other thing that's important to keep in mind with this stuff, too, is it, it's, it doesn't only... Ex the cost isn't only going to the candidates. This is a little bit of an aside, but I just while we're talking about rising costs, this is really fascinating to me. So this is an article from the Pew Research Center, and they get into something really interesting here. So I had seen a lot of people mention this in other articles, and I was struggling to kind of get a, a breakdown of what's going on, so... It's the Field Guide to Polling Election 2020 Edition. Um, so they go through and they say, is polling broken? Uh, here's a myth that we can set aside right now. Polling is not broken. We'll design it carefully. Administrative surveys still work. And they go through. So now here we go. Here at Air National Poll, it was historically low. But this isn't what's interesting to me. What's interesting to me, and I apologize for one second. I want to make sure I get the right thing. Here we go. They say, meanwhile, the costs for phone polls have curved sharply upward, largely driven by the challenge of getting responders to talk on the phone. This limits wow. the number of organizations able to underwrite a rigorous phone survey, and the expense of phone polls is particularly highlighted when compared with the low cost of the sur of the latest survey mode on the block, which would be online polls. Yeah. However, online polls are still 
people are concerned that they're kind of cheatable. There, yeah, there isn't the, the people. It's getting better. By you the can month. take it twice. You can have two different email well, yeah. addresses that count as two people. There's a, a lot the of same things. concerns that we have about a voter registration. You actually can use bots. <laughs> like yeah. I talk about bots online all the time. That's actually like, for example, you know how people buy limited edition sneakers when they come out? Yeah, bots, AI bots. Put the stuff in your cart and purchase it for you because they will sell out in a second. Otherwise, like that's, I, I know people who've given someone who've given people on the internet five hundred dollars to have their AI bot buy shoes for them. And if they don't get, if the, if the AI bot misses out on the shoes, they only have to pay them like half the money. Like it's a racket, man. But yeah. th that's how the it, it's gotten so competitive there. But to get back to this, it, what's really it looks like is happening here is it's getting more expensive to run everything. Polls are more expensive to conduct. Ads more expensive to run. Hey, staff, remember we said Michael Bloomberg's paying his staff a pretty penny? I'm not sure if every one of these new 500 staffers are getting that same sweet deal. Maybe some of them only get 30 grand to work part-time. But Michael Bloomberg is not only taking up the TV time, he's going out and hiring up these people that would be the kind of mercenaries you bring in to help put a campaign over the top. Yeah. They're working for Bloomberg. We'll pay them until November, so they just can't work for anyone else's I'm going campaign. Going over, brother. Yeah, pretty I'm much. Going it's, over, brother. And, and it's it's getting to the point now where it is one. Like, how do you compete with this? The roughly 300 staffers working in the campaign's New York headquarters are set to move into a new building in Times Square to accommodate their burgeoning ranks. The Super du Tuesday staffing, which puts grassroots leadership teams and organizers in all the March contest states, as well as in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which vote in April, solidifies Bloomberg as having the largest organization in the field after the four early states in February. And again, worth mentioning, Michael Bloomberg is punting the early states. He really doesn't care about him. He's not going to be in the ballot yeah. in Iowa and New Hampshire. He's not going to be on the ballot. He will not be. He's not. I don't think he's. I think he's running some ads there still because why not? I'm spending money everywhere else, but yeah. less, much less. And there was that one uh, New Hampshire poll that we looked at where he had like four commercials that had run in the entire state or something, but. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't remember exactly but, but which again, here's, state it was. But. This is another interesting thing that I want to get not too much into, but again, Bloomberg's strategy is this. Fine. You guys can have those four early states. By the time you get to those Super Tuesday states, I've dumped $50 million into each state in the last quarter. You can't raise that Jeez. in a quarter. It, the thing is, what do you do again? And because the other funny thing is he's not necessarily, you know, exploding in the polls it isn't like you know it's not like you know like you ever seen like the, the classic jeb meme it's not like that you know what i mean yeah but at the same time he's also not necessarily doing nothing uh let's see he's currently right now uh, his name's a little bit cut off here he's currently fourth in aggregate polling at 7.5 percent yeah but like basically oh, sorry. No, gonna so, be third hold on, let me, he's fourth, he's fifth in aggregate or fourth in aggregate polling at no, I apologize. But I mean, he's trending but, so so fast that the second we start pulling again right consistently, he's, he's fifth at five point eight percent. I apologize. This 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 formatting was weird. He's fifth in overall polling. But by the way, he's two points ahead of Andrew Yang. Now, remember, he wow. spent probably I don't know fifty times the money Andrew Yang's raised already. But what what? How are because like the candidates in the front, Biden, Sanders, Warren, they can compete with the money, but they can just compete on name alone. But really. How do you compete with someone like a Bloomberg? What do you do? He's going to outspend you, and he doesn't actually. He's like you would have to get on a debate stage with him, and this this is the but hopeful. But you can't remember. No, yeah, this is the hopeful in me. You would have to be able to get on the debate stage with him, in which personality and policy were juxtaposed. You you would have to get that that level playing field. Now, he can buy his way onto the debate stage, but he can't buy his way into the hearts of the American people. You get what I'm saying? But he can buy attention away from the other candidates. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying... Like, you read Ayn Rand. There was this genius uh, guy that was a miner in Mexico, and he actually built a bunch of houses around this old mine that he built, and he sent a bunch of people down there to live through for a year. And when all of the other mining companies saw that he was mining in Mexico, they just bought up huge tracts of land that were overpriced, started sending down um, uh, uh, you know, their best employees down there to go uh, prospecting for gold and so on and so forth. And then finally what happened was the original miner just pulled out his like 15 employees that were just you know day hires. And 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 then destroyed the homes that were built out of cardboard. You know what I'm saying? And he had literally done it just so that the spies that were spying on his mining operation would report to their <laughs> would report to their you know their head honchos, and then actually invest real 
billions of dollars trying to chase that that or that he was famous for prospecting and finding first and so yeah all of that legal transparent the, the cool stories that you talk about in economic history um in in the bouts of the billionaires right but i think i think politics is slightly different like <laughs> healthcare for us and our children is more than just an industry. I, I think politics for Americans is a little bit more than just a billionaire's playground. You know, there are a couple of fields in our society that we just view as slightly more sacred and important than to be at the whims of a billionaire. <laughs> you know, but um, I mean, I, I think I honestly think if you want to, it's one of those things where. Our European friends are going to have a field day with this. That yeah, the optics the Super- are horrible. Well, during the Super Bowl, two opposing billionaires, both from New York City, one a former Democrat is now a Republican, one a former Republican is now a Democrat, are spending ten million dollars to run one sixty second. Jeez, is mean, there any better American political like like snapshot? That New will York be your day, Cody. Who don't care about the parties they represent at all. They just claim to spending a boatload of money to be in front of Americans watching the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. It's it's hilarious, hey, Cody, man. Cody, you, that will be your day because I got to tell you all the time in pre-show me and Cody are arguing about the morals and ethics of different situations. And he doesn't like that. I oftentimes will side with a more conservative, especially economically true. conservative That's view. True. Oh, no, you call me right wing SJW regularly. No, I, um, I put fun at you when you get really offended over someone else just having a different okay. opinion than you. Yeah. Well, no, but, uh, between you and me, I am the one that is to believe more that one side of the argument has the moral high ground. You consistently think that both are absolute sellouts. You know what I'm saying? And that the, the both are just toxic. And it's going to be very difficult the week of the Super Bowl for me to defend <laughs> to, 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 to me to defend my thesis yeah. on on that day when truly it's billionaire death match yeah. where both changed political affiliation both from New York City and both from New York City's wealthy elite I mean that is a really tough a tough um a tough thesis to defend uh, that week. Hey, like I said, man, <laughs> 2020, welcome to serfdom. You know what I mean? 2020, welcome to serfdom. Is, if it's not too much of an aside, do you want to tell people what that means? Uh, no. You don't? Okay, cool. Because it, it is an aside. That's why. It's a big aside. Okay. Maybe Stay we should, tuned. We should, make, we should make our own video. Uh, Cody basically suspects the... Actually, I won't even say what he suspects. There's a slogan for uh, his suspicions in 2020 that is embodied in the term welcome to serfdom. And I have to tell you, when there's two billionaires fighting it out in the Super Bowl, <laughs> I can't help but kind of feel like a surf. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I can't quite help but feel like a surf. Yeah. So anyway, um, let us know what you guys think. Please, if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure that you ring the bell and you press it twice. A lot of you guys have asked us about videos we've made on controversial topics, about unnamed Middle Eastern countries who you can't say on the tube of you or else uh, they will get omitted. And we have indeed made those videos about these unnamed Middle Eastern countries, but um, you're not seeing them oftentimes unless you are subscribed to every video we make, which means you have to press the, uh, the bell button so there's a little parentheses on the side so you can see every single one of our videos. Also, make sure you bookmark, bookmark our page. Make sure that you check it out every day. Um, everything we do, we want to be accessible to you. Make sure also, so we continue to grow, that you share this with your friends. And you make sure that you like and you subscribe. This is Problem Solver Politics. We will see you guys in the next video.